So um, without further ado, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with uh, the um, pre presentation program, just to give you an idea of what's coming up. I've broken this up into eight segments and then the Q&A. Um, so uh, the first part, that sort of very brief introduction to Minito's Community Memory Project, then we're going to cover the digital archive, which kind of examines the concept of the digital archive uh, and how it's different than a traditional archive. Um, the third thing will be archival standards. Um, many of you have probably heard me expound at length about these. I'm uh, really just going to introduce what those are and make the case for them. Uh, then we'll move into the kind of the training. It'll start with an overview, which is an overview, um, kind of cover some basic concepts. Uh, and then we will move on to photos, basically smartphone as still camera, audio, smartphone as digital audio recorder, uh, video, smartphone as camcorder, and then I'm going to talk very briefly about activating the archive, which is, after all, why we would go through all this trouble, really, is going to be about that. And then we'll do the Q&A. So, um, let's see. Segment one. Uh, this is the introduction to the Minutos Community Memory Project. Uh, this is a very nice logo that I wanted to show, share off. Uh, it was designed by an uh, intern at New Mexico Highlands University, Chris Romero. Um, Chris is, uh, uh, you know, part of that, uh, part of the Media Arts Program, and the Media Arts Program is a very important part of the Minitos Community Memory Project. They're our, our, our institutional sponsor, and working with the department closely has really led to a lot of fruitful uh, activity and projects, and you'll see some more of those later, uh, but I wanted to show off this logo. Uh, so, um, the Minitos Community Memory Project. Uh, I think what's really a good way to try to introduce what we're doing is it, it's a it's about creating it's about a lot of things but mainly it's all centered around creating a, a community-based digital archive for Benito's heritage and culture and the story that I think really illustrates this is uh, part of the origin of this project was uh, at a meeting it, it, that was in Taos actually that um, was supposed to center around some uh, FSA photographs and th that project never really came out the way it was supposed to but at that meeting uh, one of those photographs was there and it became this kind of lightning rod for the energy of the room and people gathered around it and started trying to figure out who was in it where it was taken uh, a lot of stuff and and that that energy and that real uh, interest in the photo as a catalyst is really kind of a lot of what's driving our motivation for creating the, the archive uh, and uh, we're, we're doing that by working with community partners, community scholars, uh, as most of you know and are, uh, in building that archive, because it's important that uh, not only the archive material, but also the vision of the archive is community-based and coming from what people want and what people need uh, for who the archive is actually about. Uh, part of that is about creating networks and practices like what, what we're doing today that are sustainable. Um, I like to use a phrase which is saying that uh, if what we can accomplish is like the, the data or material in this presentation and other things that come out of the things that we do uh, become as much a part of a community's heritage as the knowledge of like how to clean an acequia, then we've probably done the right thing. Uh, the last thing I'd like to cover on the screen, which is uh, a mantra, I guess you could say, that I've been asking people to consider is, what is required to collect the stories out of your communities? Uh, this is going to be different to my mind for every community. There's not going to be a single uh, solution that can be helicoptered in. So really, even figuring that out is collaborative and, and very um, kind of, I think, important to keep in mind. Um, so let's see. Uh, this. Uh, that was a brief introduction. I probably would have liked it to be briefer, but if you want to know more uh, about this, there's two really good resources. One is our blog, the minitos.net uh, that you see here. Um, uh, and it's, it, it kind of is our process place. We explore uh, how we're thinking about things. A lot of our partners write blogs for us, and it kind of gives a really good feel for uh, how we're working and what we're doing. The other one I really like to recommend is our project director, Estevan Rael Galvez, who is kind of a lot of the visionary behind this project. Before this project wrote uh, a paper that's on Medium at that link there uh, called Re uh, Reimagining Community Center Sites for uh, uh, History and Heritage. And it's a really good macro overview of the concepts that uh, undermine our project. 
and a cracking good read as well. Uh, this slide's kind of self-explanatory. It is my uh, uh, contact information. Uh, I, as part of uh, uh, what I'm doing this summer and really for the rest of the year is having these virtual office hours, uh, I encourage you to uh, send me an email and request a telephone call or Zoom if you want to do, if you need any clarification, for example, in any of the trainings, want to talk about it, need better information, uh, want to chat about your projects and maybe where they can intersect with what many of the project could help do. Um, you know, really any reason. I, I'm 9 to 2, I have blocked out definitely, although it's good to probably check to make sure I don't, I'm not talking with someone else. But, you know, honestly, really I'm available anytime that you want to talk at your convenience. So feel free to send an email and say, I, I got this. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially if it's something in one of these trainings that I know I can help with, I'll do my best to find information if I don't have it and otherwise be supportive, I guess. Uh, think of me, I guess, as some kind of weird general tech support of some kind. Um, so on to segment two. Um, well, really quick. Uh, well, no, I, I don't see any questions yet. Or I don't know if I can check for questions. I didn't actually check this to see if I can. Well, oh, yeah, I guess when I'm in here, I can't uh, see if questions are coming up. So, you know, I'm just going to say this is a glitch. I, let's save all questions till the end because I'm not seeing if they are popping up. So apologies if you, it's urgent, but I, I think that we just have to do this um, and, and keep going. It was probably a better idea to do that for the start anyway. So the digital archive. Um, uh, so I lost my place. When we speak of a digital archive, what are we talking about exactly? Uh, at its very basis, a digital archive is a digital record of things. Uh, many, if not most of these things, exist as physical artifacts, objects, photos, documents. Uh, then we have a gray zone, uh, physical media like books, video, audio tape. They themselves are also artifacts, but often we really are more after the information contained in them than, than their, their isness. Uh, some media is digital in origin, digital audio or video recordings or digital transfers of analog recordings. Uh, this uh, collection here is a very good example of that. It's, it's at Fry Angelico. Um, and it's a rather comprehensive, as you can see, 902 reel-to-reel -reel tapes of uh, audio information that Jock Loeffler, who is a recordist, collected here in New Mexico. Uh, the Fry Angelico has digitized most of it. Um, and are close to all of it maybe, and that makes it a little bit more accessible, but this is kind of a lot of the activity we may end up doing for ourselves with our archives is, is transferring things like this. Um, and as part of the collection that we'll talk about later that we can do with our devices as well. Um, so uh, all of these things, these artifacts, whether they have a physical world analog or not, are subject to the whims of fate, capable of getting damaged, lost, or simply degrading over time. Uh, what the digital archive does at its best is preserve all of these resources in a digital format in what one might describe as a charm or a ward against the passage of time. Uh, as, as a result, the digital archive becomes an important access point to these digital resources uh, for the for purposes of, you know, what museum folk like to call interpretation the creation of meaning from these resources. Interpretation can be as, as ambitious as a museum exhibit and as subtle as changing the color values or cropping a photo. An important thing to consider here, and we'll return to this concept later, is that the role of the digital collector or archivist is actually to avoid interpretation. Our goal is to strive to preserve an artifact digitally as true as we can possibly make it to the original thing that it is. In a word, fidelity. The techniques we go over later strive towards fidelity and try to avoid interpretation. Um, so what are we preserving exactly? Uh, the Menitos archive could likely not exist if there was not people already on the ground documenting family histories and collecting historical materials, photos, documents, artifacts, sharing and comparing information. And when it comes right down to it, what matters to everyone is the content. Uh, in the case of a photo, for example, what matters is are the people recognizable? Who are they? When was the photo taken? And what are the stories involved in the photo? Uh, what does it invoke? Uh, the same goes for an oral history. Uh, what is being said? Who is saying it? Or as the case may be, singing it. Um, 
on the Facebook community groups that are in some ways the origin of this project, and I know that we might have some people here who were involved in creating some of those, uh, photos of photos generate a great deal of enthusiasm. Some photos can generate hundreds of comments, adding information to the community knowledge base, opening networks of associative data. But field documentation is tricky and conditions are imperfect. Uh, so often those photos of photos are distorted, the color or the focus is off. There's a shadow across the surface. Part of the photo is missing, like, like here. In the case of audio and video, technical obstacles are common. Noise and signal loss can obscure crucial information. Uh, sometimes these understandable imperfections are an obstacle to interpretation. To give you an example of how multifaceted collection and archival challenges can be, uh, this photo was in a photo album that many people remembered existed uh, when I started looking in the Las Vegas history, but it couldn't be found. I actually stumbled across the album. It was misfiled in the wrong drawer, in a wrong cabinet, in the rare book room at Carnegie Library. Uh, the photo has physical damage. As you can see, this kind of shadow was actually water damage. It's actually much worse in person. And you know, it, it can, it's, it's, it's scaring the signage dead or it threatens to uh, for that building. Uh, and it's also believed to be maybe the crop of a larger photo. The original, as far as anybody knows, is lost. Uh, but we're fortunate to have it back because all digital versions of this photo are fairly low quality or, or they were newsprints out of a newspaper. And you know, that's its own thing and problem. So now the analog source can be scanned again digitally at a much higher quality and archived for future use. Um, another challenge, and to return to Facebook for a moment, because it's really also kind of an origin point for this project, is that the web is an amazing space for sharing, but it's terrible for archival or storage solutions. Uh, Facebook heavily compresses photos, rendering them a very poor digital rendition of the original. As you can see here in this graphic, an original photo might be roughly 1.15 megabytes. Uh, even the desktop version of Facebook reduces that to a third of the original size. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, you know, is, is really not good. Also, in regards to Facebook, um, they can eliminate all content at any moment. They're in total control of that environment. Uh, Facebook group can vanish in an instant along with all of its data. And so you have no control. The community has no control over its own heritage when it's in a third party space like a social media site. Um, so, you know, if you've ever saved a Facebook photo and try to view it bigger or print it as a poster, you know what I mean about the image degradation. It rapidly starts to pixelate and go really, really wrong uh, in, a, in very bad ways. So, um, regarding archival standards, uh, the kind of intra archival standard realm when we're talking uh, about how to not have this happen. Uh, there, there are guidelines that have been developed by the archivist community to, to ensure that digital versions of photos, documents, and audiovisual elements in their collections provide the highest quality, uncompressed of primary documents uh, and photos in their collections. Uh, really all, all media, everything in the collection uh, has standards. Uh, this ensures that the master files in a digital collection represent as accurately as possible the original artifact itself. In addition, by striving to meet or exceed these standards, digital archives can, can, can to some extent future-proof themselves against the limitations of technology. Why is future-proofing important? Uh, for example, again, to return to Las Vegas, since I do a lot of work here, uh, in, in the 80s, some local scholars took it upon themselves to collect what at the time in particular was a kind of an endangered photographic heritage. And they actually did a pretty extraordinary job of gathering up things. Uh, a lot of them actually live now at Katie's library uh, there at Donnelly at, at Highlands. Um, and, and they did this using the best technology available to them at the time. Uh, they scanned many photos actually that ended up having to be returned to their uh, owners as well. Uh, and right now, a lot of those scans for the digital versions that are kind of out there, they're at 300 DPI. This is at the lower limits of our current technology. Uh, right now, most of the scans as they exist um, are great for online use. They can be used in some publications for like books, but they can't really, really be used for posters or in emerging technologies like augmented reality. So meeting when possible and exceeding archival standards is future-proofing these things and letting these digital versions be useful for as long as possible. Uh, the National Archives and Records Administration have the human power and resources to research and develop digital archival standards 
in an astoundingly meticulous detail, um, as you could probably tell from the last two slides. And they've been compelled to share those standards online. Uh, on this slide, uh, and this is kind of to preserve it for the deck. Uh, by the way, this deck is available to all of you if you want it for future reference or to share it with other people. Um, I just ask me and I'll send it to you. Um, so, but, so this link will take you to their standards. It's, I'm warning you, it's quite a rabbit hole. You can fall into it and, and spend way too much time and, and come out of it um, feeling overwhelmed. Um, but when you condense the standards, you end up with basically these following goals. Um, create, well, I won't read it to you, you can, you can read it. Uh, but in a way, these, these three will be mantras as we move through the workshop. I truly believe that digital archival standards are an achievable goal for community uh, collectors and archivists. Uh, you know, field collection is a creature of necessity and make do. So if you do fall into the rabbit hole, don't get discouraged if you think your smartphone cannot reach these pinnacles of, uh, of, of uh, you know, cloud, cloudy heights. Uh, even major archives like the Smithsonian or Fry Angelico, for example, uh, often balance what is practical with what is ideal, just because they deal with volume. And, and, you know, often it's an accessibility thing. You want to save these really big files, but you know you need smaller versions too for people to be able to access them easily, things like that. But for our purposes, we will concentrate on the reasonable, achievable goals uh, that can be accomplished with the tools we have, and we'll use NARA as our lodestar. Uh, to kind of do this. Um, so I wanted you to be familiar with it. Um, I'm including this graphic here in the deck for later contemplation if you decide to go do the deck. I think it does a good job of uh, uh, crystallizing the archivist's workflow and thought process and it's really a helpful graphic to me to uh, just sort of go, okay, now I, I kind of have a map of what we're doing uh, and uh, so I'm leaving it here for that purpose. Um, so I will move now quickly on to the next segment, segment four, which is where we're starting to get into the practical uh, nitty gritty of things. Um, so, you know, when we started thinking about what was going to go into the visual archive and how to collect it, the, the question quickly became, was it possible to build a workflow that starts with the technology that people already use, uh, smooth out the learning curve so that people, you know, don't go, oh, man, this is too hard, I don't want to do this anymore. So, you know, smoothing out the learning curve was really kind of important. And then achieve that sustainable practice that I talked about, where the knowledge becomes infused into the community and is able to be transmitted person to person uh, in that community, um, you know, without our involvement, I guess you could say. Uh, it was a new and challenging idea. Um, tra traditional approaches to field work often involve specialized technology. You know, when Alan Lomax crisscrossed America making his famous field recordings for the Library of Congress, he had to lug around like a, tr a car trunk full of very finicky state-of-the-art equipment that recorded like on aluminum discs. It was crazy actually that he was able to record a lot of the stuff he was in like prisons and fields. And he did it out of like this giant thing in the trunk of his car. But luckily for us, we live in a time that many of us carry around this amazing all-in-one field collection device in our pockets, which as you know, is already the subject of what we're talking about. However, that technology is not without its challenges and limitations. And so what we're really gonna do today is explore actually how to work around those challenges that are inherent in those devices. Um, and, and as well as cover some best practices and some uh, accessories that enhance things. We're gonna cover a little bit of that too. So if it's handy now, please get out your smartphone. Uh, don't worry too much. Uh, if you don't have it, you can cover this later. And really what I'm kind of wanting to take away from this very brief sort of interactive segment is, um, uh, is really that getting to know your device is a crucial thing. You really gotta get under the hood, mess around with the settings, uh, read the manual, go on a forums and find out what might be a problem that you're having or an obstacle. There's a lot of crowdsourcing of, of solutions that are, might be specific to your device or how you're trying to do things. Uh, one immediate predicament that we have is some of us have iOS phones and some have Android devices. Uh, we're gonna get address that in a minute. It actually is a big quandary, um, but we'll cover it as we go through things. Uh, so we're gonna cover three basic uh, areas of field collection. Uh, photo, um, you know, video and audio. Um, but 
you know, if you can think of any other situations in your field work that isn't covered by those three things, I'd really actually like to know about it. I think we'd all like to know about it because we want solutions for those things as well. So if whatever predicament you have isn't covered under those three fields, let's get together, talk about it, and we'll either do another training about it or make sure it's included in sort of whatever solutions we can figure out are, are included in the sort of knowledge base. Um, uh, another qualifier that I'd like to say here uh, and um, before we jump into the smartphone is that field recording is often, as I might have said earlier, is, is not an ideal situation often for collecting things. Uh, when it comes especially to photos and documents, um, it's better to try to get those things to a scanner and get it to higher quality and better technology if you can. But you know the the caveat to that is that field recording is often it's not only exciting but it's often necessary. Many of us that do this kind of work have learned that people are often reluctant to take these materials out of their house um, for very good reason. Uh, and often storytelling magic is really only captured when someone is in their element. Uh, you know there there's a lot uh, of times where someone's ability to convey their story involves walking around their house and picking up things and putting them down, showing things. This is, uh, this is not to be discounted at all. So hence, hence our focus on field recording is when, when you need to do it or when it's gonna be necessary for capturing the magic. Um, uh, so uh, that being said, we're gonna start to look at the, the, the field options. Um, a foundational predicament of what we're about to do is that our phones are indeed smart and smarter every day, which paradoxically means that they encourage us to be dumb. Uh, those of you that are photographers may remember that when phones were dumber, that you had actually had more access to camera controls. You actually had, could be better photographers uh, or, or more artistic photographers, but now it's almost impossible to do that with current devices. Uh, this kind of actually works for fidelity, um, but a lot of the other things a phone do that takes away controls over us doesn't help us, and that's what a lot of what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, there's the, essentially a very primitive artificial intelligence that now lives in your phone, and it makes a lot of decisions for you now, and getting those decisions back is uh, really uh, the, the province, uh, and what we're going to be looking mostly at is third-party apps. You're not going to be able to do the things we need to do with your phones the way they're. You're going to have to download apps, and those apps are going to help you uh, optimize or, or, or your, your process. But right now, we are going to go over some controls that you can do with your phone uh, that sort of help, not really. But I'm hoping that this will say this is this uh, it, this encourages you to to get it get into your phone and get out your old. Uh, uh, you know, I don't even know if they ship things with, with uh, um, uh, instruction manuals anymore. I think you have to download them. Uh, so the first screen you're going to, um, so, so Apple people will recognize the one on the left. Android people will recognize the one on the right. Go there now, get into your settings. Uh, the first screen that you will see will look something like this. Um, this now seems a good time to address our Apple Android duality. You are going to notice that all my examples will be for the iPhone. And yes, it's true, I am an Apple person, but um, I need to highlight for you a technical reality that's unfortunate for people who are Android users uh, when it gets to the subject of third party software. Uh, Apple is a walled garden. And uh, so, what that means is that it forces developers to kind of use a monocultural developer kit for their apps. And it means that they're able to to innovate a little bit more. Uh, they know that when they solve a technical solution in their programming, that it's gonna apply to all users. Android devices uh, have a polyglot of competing standard, which means that developers can't standardize the experience for all users, and it leaves them with less of an opportunity to really uh, uh, do some of the things that are possible on Apple devices. And you're gonna hear me apologize several times for this as we're going through, but I really did do my best to try to find the best solutions for Android people. So from this screen, I want you to go into camera or whatever camera is best at. Uh, we're gonna first look at some video settings. So go into an Apple record video or the Android equivalent. Uh, the two things that you're gonna notice here on this screen are the settings themselves and this handy dandy comparison chart. The comparison chart 
uh, is an excellent tool to help you plan your video shoot and make decisions based on your field recording plan, which you should always do before shooting video in the field whenever possible. But really, it's a good practice also for if you're going to do audio recording. It's good to, to have this plan from a technical standpoint. Uh, you want to kind of know you know, your, or know what kind of memory your device has available to you when you shoot. Say you're going to go to a fiesta and you know that there's three events that you want to uh, document. They're all going to last about two hours and there's 15 interviews that you want to collect half hour each. You're going to want to your, you know your device can hold all that. This chart helps you do that based on your settings. Um, you just got to do the math. Uh, so, you know, it may be that you have to either plan to uh, reduce the quality of what you're collecting if you think you're going to be way out in the field, or it means you have to plan to, when you get back to your hotel room, download everything onto your computer and clear everything off for the next day so you have space. Uh, or if you're lucky, you've got plenty of space and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, regarding the settings, the ones that you see here is a happy medium, really, uh, 1080p HD at 30 frames per second. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, I, I, there's a thing I'd like you to think about in regards to the subject that's actually an archival thing that can be a bit surprising. Archivists actually, you know, 4K isn't really that fancy anymore. It used to be actually. But one of the things to consider is uh, if you're doing things that are really high quality to the point that you have to use specialized file types uh, and things like that, this actually probably isn't the best idea. You want to find things that have a happy medium and that are really popularly supported because a lot of what archivists look at is can will this file 20 years from now have any machines that can even read it and so making sure that you're using um, good quality but common file types is a way of future proofing uh, and not getting yourself stuck uh, trying to search eBay for a $600 obsolete machine that's the only thing that can read your file you know in 20 years uh, so um, uh, so, so that's a good thing to think about. Uh, 30 frames per second, uh, talking about that just for a minute is, uh, that is a really good thing to use when capturing video because whenever you go to edit video, the closer you can get to what's gonna work in the editing program is gonna be happy. And video is 30 frames per second. So if you're using 24 or 60, your editing program has to now convert that and it's an opportunity to introduce problems into your file. It's not really that big of a deal, like Premiere is very robust, but it's a good practice to think about things like that uh, as, you're, as you're choosing things like this. Um, and then, so get out of this, um, go back to the last screen, and then uh, at least on Mac, you're gonna go into something called format. Uh, we're looking at camera settings, and really mostly actually what I wanna say about this is, this is why we're gonna need three-party apps. This is currently all that Apple will let you choose between they don't even trust you to actually know what it means, but they give you a little description. But honestly, uh, you're never going to want to do anything with this anyway, because both of these are really JPEGs, which are lossy file formats. Uh, and because they want to compress photos and be able to tell you in the commercial that you can fit 10,000 photos on your camera. Uh, and they assume you're never going to take your photos off your camera anyway. So they compress everything. That makes it useless for our purposes of fidelity. Um, uh, as far as audio goes really quick, um, uh, onboard audio, there just aren't a lot of options for either device. Apple has this onboard app called Voice Memo that is actually pretty good in a pinch because it records in mono. Uh, but trying to get recordings off your devices is a bit of a nightmare. And we're actually going to talk about that more than you probably think we should. Getting things off your device is not to be underestimated as uh, being a thing that you want a really good solution for. Uh, and all that's better, best done with third-party apps, uh, which is where the fun really starts and kind of where we're going to move to now. This is segment five. We're moving on to uh, photo. So smartphone as still camera. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about that AI that lives in your phone. Um, you know, smartphones have reached the point where the only things they can really improve every year uh, to get you to buy a new one are processing power and cameras. That means that smartphone cameras are actually ridiculously good. Uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned, all, the, all of that, none of, almost none of that is under your control. Uh, especially for photos, third-party apps have changed all that. Uh, their main job is to bypass the AI and give you a great inter interface for controlling every aspect of uh, the little miracles these smartphone cameras have become. 
Uh, in practicality, what that means is that most of these apps do most of the same things. The, the only difference is interface. Uh, another thing this means is that the apps are constantly being updated or they disappear. Some get better and some kind of jump the shark. They get overdeveloped and actually become terrible. Uh, so what I'd like to really do and emphasize is don't rely on any of the apps necessarily that I recommend, although I really like the ones I'm gonna recommend because things are gonna change. I'd like you to get used to being able to identify what works best for how you work in the interface and uh, making sure that it has some crucial fe features that allow you to approach archival standards. So it's gonna mean that every time you do go to, to see an app, you're gonna wanna do a little bit of research. Uh, and you know, so it's these three things are what you're looking for. How is it easy for you to take a picture for the way that you think? How easy is it for you to get your photos out of the camera? Again, uh, can't stress this enough. And how much control you have over your format settings? And when it comes to format settings, uh, the magic words uh, for archival uh, you know, quality for Apple is lossless TIFFs, and for Android, it's raw. To be honest, the real magic word is lossless TIFFs, but Android doesn't have a standardized protocol, so you kind of have to settle for raw uh, uh, you know, when you're, unfortunately for Andrew, this is one of those places where I apologize. Uh, what these two formats have in common is that they're grabbing your photo and saving it before the little AI can get its lossy little hands on it. Uh, these are uncompressed file formats. And this is what archival standards require uh, whenever possible from photos. The main difference for this is that lossless TIFFs are uh, what you see is what you get kind of, uh, uh, protocol, so you can trust what you're seeing on your touch screen when you're doing your documentation. Uh, what raw grubs, is, raw does is it grabs what's, it, and actually raw, Apple does raw if you want to do this too. Uh, raw grabs exactly what comes off your sensor. Uh, and so what it means is you have to end up adjusting some things that, uh, you know, you might have wanted a preset before like saturation, color value, exposure, things like that. Uh, it's taking a very basic photo and you know, photographers love this because that's the art of photography is adding these things back in things like Photoshop. But for our purposes, uh, um, you know, it means that you're gonna have to go into Photoshop and do some work. And this is the slippery path to interpretation. Uh, and I don't like that because the temptation to sweeten images is a mighty, mighty temptation. So you have to have a lot of discipline and really be careful uh, when you're working with raw photos, when you're trying to make something to go into the archive. I was hoping that when I updated this presentation that Android had solved its little lossless tip problem, but so far nothing yet. But keep looking if you have an Android, just check in every once in a while and go, have they solved that lossless tip problem yet? Uh, one thing I like about lossless files, is, or, or one thing I actually don't like, it's, it's a thing you should know about, is that they tend to be much larger than your lossy Instagram shots. Uh, so I wanted to just show you how different uh, the, the uh, these are info files, the one on the left that shows the TIFF, 48 megabytes, which is a big file. Uh, JPEGs are 3.6. So when you're doing your planning and you know you're shooting TIFF, which you should do, know that you're dealing with these photo sizing. Get really familiar with that. As you can see also, TIFFs will give you a lot more information about your photo uh, for the metadata, which is a good thing. This is why you want to try to get metadata out with your files if possible, because this is important information to keep with your photos as they go into an archive, because people are gonna wanna know this in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years probably. Um, so uh, there are tons of camera apps out there. Find the one that's right for you. Check review sites, uh, purchase likely candidates. You're not buying a DSLR now, so you've got a little bit of money to spend $6 on an app every now and again. Uh, and often there's uh, free light versions that let you try these out uh, as you get a chance. ProCam is my hands down favorite. It's the internet's hands down favorite. I think they're actually up to program seven now. I should probably update that image. Uh, the thing to watch for here with ProCam is that the developer is uh, Samer Azam. Uh, there, this is such a good program that there's tons of sound alike imitators now, basically named ProCam, uh, but they're not this one. And this is the one that you want. Uh, here's a control screen of what it looks like. Uh, and as you can see up at the top, I have TIFF selected because it does lossless TIFFs. And you know, this is kind of an example. Down here you can see you have all your camera controls. This is, this is a real DSLR, autofocus, ISO, uh, your you know, uh, white balance and everything. It's very easily accessible. This is one that works for me. Uh, you got your little zoom thing up here in the, in the corner. 
you know, this is where you're going to want to look and go, how does, how do I think? Does this work the way that I think? Uh, um, and, 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 and the thing that you're going to want to look at with these apps too, again, is how you're going to get your photos out. In, often there's a setting where what it'll tell you is, do you want to save this to your photos or do you want to save it in the app? And then you want to check if you save it in the app that it's somewhere that you can, you know, it's often actually a thing they really pay attention to that is better than your phone. It'll send it to your cloud or, or do whatever else you want to do with it. It's a thing to, to keep in mind when you're selecting is that getting out thing. Uh, for Android, again, I will apologize. This article is really the best breakdown of raw photo apps that I can find. Obviously, I don't have a raw device, so I couldn't try any of them out. But this article does a really good job of giving you an overview and, and it's still the better one. I, I checked for a new one, this is still the best one. So um, I will have to refer you to their expertise in this case. Uh, the tips for, that you kind of need to, for documenting photos in the field and, and don't have a scanner is that one thing is to remember that we're going for fidelity and not interpretation. Um, what really helps for this uh, uh, on my list here is diffuse even light is your main key. You want uh, there to be no hot points. Uh, one important thing regarding smartphone is know your phone's optical zoom, okay? Uh, always phones talk about optical zoom and digital zoom. Digital zoom is a horrible, horrible lie that the phone industry wants to play on you. All they're doing with digital zoom is actually taking their sensor and zooming in on a portion of your, their, your sensor. So all you're looking at are those pixels in that part of the sensor. Forget digital zoom exists. Know your phone's optical zoom. And if you're gonna zoom in, you know, your, your screen will tell you how much you're zooming in. If it's five times or two times, never go further than that when you're zooming. Uh, place your subject on a neutral plane background and avoid too much space around your subject. This is kind of the same as the digital zoom. All that extra space is wasted pixels and never, ever, ever use a flash. Uh, another couple of things to think about here. Um, uh, well, actually what I'll talk about is the thing that you're looking at. This is the shot box, okay? This is a worthy investment if you're gonna think you're gonna be doing a lot of documentation in the field of documents and photos. And it solves a lot of the problems I just mentioned. There's lights inside this box that even out the light. And what, what I really like about this is that, as you can see on the top, there's these holes. The designers designed this for smartphones and DSLRs, it works for both. What you're doing is you're placing your phone on the top of that box, pointing the camera through that hole, and you have a perfect field of vision for whatever documents can fit in this box. Um, I've included a, uh, a link to their how-to page, which is a good tutorial in general. Uh, if you don't have one of these, a good alternative and workaround to do is, you know, a lot of what we're trying to eliminate is when you're hand-holding photos and trying to pick, take a picture of something square or rectangular, you're never going to get it right. It's going to end up a trapezoid because you're never going to get the plane uh, aligned correctly. This takes all the guesswork out of that. You are pointing it at exactly a 90 degree angle or whatever it is. You can do that by, and it's a, usually a crazy terrible workaround, is in the field when you're doing this, find a tabletop, a countertop, it's your camera over the edge as far as you can where you can hold it down and access the controls and put everything below it that you want to photograph and you can pretty much approximate this uh, and be sure and place the things that you have are using on a clean background so that you can replicate the uniform background and stuff like that. So that's a workaround you can do if you don't have the shot box or something like it. Um, so uh, regarding audio, we'll move on to audio now. Uh, this is the app that I recommend for audio, uh, primarily because of its options for file management and how to get things off your device, which uh, is an important issue for all media formats, but especially for audio. Um, Mac is, the worst defender in this, but I think Android has a problem too, which is that they want to push all your audio files into like iTunes or eMusic or, or whatever it's called. And this is a terrible place for them to end up. A, it's probably have, will have compressed or altered the file and you don't want it in there anyway. You want it where you can immediately get it into your editing program. So uh, that's an almost uh, one of the most important features of using a, a, a recorder. This recorder is really good and I'm gonna kind of go over uh, some of its features using uh, it as an example because it really is the gold standard. Um, 
And, and so just one really thing about that transfer uh, thing, one of the things you wanna make sure that the app does, and this goes for all file types, is when you are transferring files out, that it's not going to do any kind of compression or fiddling with your file. Oh, whoops, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Uh, you know, while, while it's transferring things out, you may wanna make sure it maintains your file integrity during transfer. So in this app, um, like what this screen shows here that I like here is under here, basic engine format, it's gonna give you a lot of options for what kind of file you're gonna record. Uh, and along with some other things that you see here. But that's a really important one, is knowing that you can choose that file type. Uh, on this screen here, uh, the thing that's a star for me is export metadata. If it gives you the option to control it, you know it's doing a pretty good job of making sure that you are getting that out and always make sure it's on. Uh, on this screen here, um, since it is the gold standard, this is a good overview. It, compare this image to the apps that you are considering and see if it does almost all of this stuff. And then learn what all this stuff is and does. You're gonna wanna to, to do that. That's longer than we can do in this. That, that's its own whole training is to go over something like that. But get to know, this is part of getting to know your device and knowing the, the, the environment and, and the, the qualities that you want out of your files. Um, here, uh, this is just an example of this getting things out of your things. One of the most popular things about this app, this is actually a really long list of like 60 things. This is just the top of the list. There's, it's this insane how many ways there are to get your files off your phone out of this app. You can send it to Google Drive or Dropbox, your computer, everything else. Um, so that, that's the, the sell for this particular app. But you know, find your, find your gem. Jumping back to photos really quick, just because this is a good time to address this. Uh, Apple and some Android devices have features like AirDrop, which is a Bluetooth protocol. And this is really good for getting photos and videos easily, and, and maybe audio files, easily off your device. Um, when you go into your Photos app, if your device is on and has AirDrop turned on and your computer does, you'll see your computer show up like mine did in this photo. And all you need to do is touch that little circle at the bottom right and make that blue check, blue check uh, box appear. And it's gonna transfer everything quickly to your desktop with your file photo or integrity intact. So that's a really helpful tool uh, for doing that. Um, when you're talking about recording audio, um, here are some things to think about. And I like this device here that I'm showing here on the left. This is a Manfrotto tabletop. I think it's called a Pixie, a P-I-X-I um, tabletop tripod. Uh, and on top of it is kind of an iPhone clamp of, or phone clamp of some kind. You're really gonna want to do, use this if you're doing any kind of oral history or interview gathering. It is unbelievable how much people and, and you're gonna find this in general about noise. Once you start recording and putting headphones on, the world is filled with noise. And one of those noises, uh, when you're doing interviews, if you would have your phone on the table, is people tap, they tap the tabletop and you're gonna pick it up. This helps eliminate that a lot. The Manfrotto is really good. And I urge you to get a high quality record, uh, tripod like this, because a lot of the cheaper ones either are really good sound conductors, which you don't want, or they're wobbly and uneven. And it's worth investing in a, a solid one. Another thing I like about this Monfrotto, if you can sort of tell by the picture, is that if you want to suddenly pick up your device and handheld it, those legs fold up into a really nice handle that you can then carry around. And this is also good for handheld video. It gives you a little bit of control. So yeah, so you wanna get your recorder off the tabletop. You wanna know where your onboard microphones are. This is gonna matter for how you point your phone. It's different in every device and often even changes uh, you know, when a device updates. Uh, you're gonna want headphones and to watch your levels. Uh, this is really important. Um, and, and you know, it's gonna be tricky. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. You're gonna wanna record all voices in mono so that you don't have to, uh, people move around when they talk a lot, more than you think they would. And a stereo recording, means that you have a really uneven record. You wanna record all voice stuff in mono if you can. Uh, if you can't or whatever, there is a way when you're editing where you find your strongest track and you throw the other one away and you duplicate that one and you create a false mono, but you don't wanna to have to go through all this. Another super important part, and I'm gonna talk about this multiple times, always remember to put your device on airplane mode. Uh, 
your phone tries to talk to your network constantly in the background, if it's trying to do that while you're recording, you're gonna get this weird electronic sound. You don't want that to happen. Putting your device in airplane mode turns all of that background communication off so you, that you get clean recordings. Uh, the URL you see there is just to information about that little tripod guy. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, I lost, lost my place for a second. Uh, I wanna see if there's any other audio things I wanted to tell you about. Um, oh yeah, actually there's quite a bit for audio. Um, so, you know, a lot of what this device helps do is you wanna make your equipment really small though, so that your subject forgets about it and that you can really concentrate on the human connection you're making. Uh, really ideally for all media, but, and even for audio, you, you want to work as a two person team as possible. It's often really helpful to have one person be the interview and the second person sits there with the headphones, staring obsessively at those monitor levels, making sure they don't peak, right? If possible, this is not a bad idea, but as one person, the tripod also even actually helps you angle things so that you can point your mics at the person and you can keep track of your levels while not really not concentrating on the person you're interviewing. Uh, recording events is a bad idea. Trying to set up interviews at a thing like a fiesta is not good. People are busy at fiestas. They they're willing to talk to you, but it's not their favorite thing and there's way too much noise. Uh, best practice is to try to set up interviews in a controlled situation, especially where the subject can be comfortable and record them in a place where you can eliminate as much background noise as possible. Also, uh, do research on your subjects in, adv in advance and have really good questions for them. This is not to be underestimated for a good interview or oral history situation. Um, people tend to freeze up even if they something they want to talk about and something they know a lot about. Somehow recording kind of stuns them a little bit and having done your research and be able to prompt them with really informed questions is a really important thing uh, to keep things on track. And it actually allows you to also let your subject meander a little bit when, when it's a good time and let them go off for a while. Because a lot of times that's when you get your best stuff. Um, and this allows you to modulate that a little better. Um, so uh, we'll move on to video now. Uh, so really with video, you know, it's possible to do this, but quite honestly, video is in some ways the most problematic of all of the things of trying to capture uh, any kind of media. So we're going to go over how it's possible and why. Uh, but honestly, uh, for video, if you have access to a, a proper video camera, and this is even better than a camcorder uh, and things like that, so your video shoot is probably going to go better. But having said that, we will now go over what you can do with your camera. Uh, so my, my app that I like is this one called Filmic Pro. It's a little expensive, not exceedingly so, but it's well worth the extra $10 compared to most of the other apps. Its controls are very intuitive. And more importantly uh, is, or more important is its compatibility with accessories that bring out the full functionality of your camera, especially when it comes to, to video. Uh, so uh, this is kind of the control screen up in the corner. Uh, you can see you have your monitor levels. The controls are these weird, the circle and the triangle that change some of your settings. You have control over your audio controls down at the bottom and some filters and stuff that hopefully you won't really want to be encouraged to use. I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what it looks there. Um, for video, in practice, you know, you want to use a tripod. Uh, you want to record audio separately whenever possible. And again, this is saying, you know, work as a team if you can. If you have to do a one-man band thing, yes, we can get you to that place, but it's better to work as a team and let one person capture the video and the other person capture audio on an audio device. Uh, and one key about doing this too is when you're doing this, make sure that each person does not turn off their device during any shot or, or portion of a shoot because uh, you want there to be continuous identical recording in both the audio and video. So when you go to sync them up later, it's really easy. You know, you do a, a loud clap at the beginning after you've turned on your devices and you have this big spike and it's easy to drop your audio in and have it sync up with your video, but it only works if nobody turned off their device. Uh, Cause then if not, it totally drifts. So working as a team is much better for video. Uh, you know, a lot of about interesting about video is in some ways video is easy um, and is really not as much of your information as you think. Audio actually carries most of the information and ends up being what people pay, uh, pay attention to. 
So having that audio be really good is really not something to be underestimated. Um, another thing, and this is kind of what I mentioned about video, is video equipment obsoletes fast, okay? Uh, even updating your phone can often break the compatibility of a piece of equipment. And so this is kind of my argument for why you want to access a video camera if you can. Committing to video with your smartphone can start to be an uh, expensive habit. Uh, another couple of things just to think about as well are watch your battery levels, especially if you're using your phone. Your battery, learn what that is and how much you can really shoot nonstop. Uh, and take that into account when you do your planning. Uh, if you want to get really fancy and have access to this or you have other team members, plan for how you're going to switch off devices and put other things back on their chargers if you're doing like all day shoots. Uh, ma battery management and memory management, get really good at them. Again, airplane mode. Airplane mode applies to when you're doing video as well. Uh, what I linked here at the bottom is uh, Filmic Pro actually has a really good set of tutorials that not only help with their device itself, but are really good for video practices. The video tutorials at that link are an excellent resource and they do it much better than uh, we have time to do here. So just watch videos if you feel like binge watching something that's you know, not Game of Thrones or something like that. Uh, for video as well, when we're talking about uh, this video enhancement, um, and it, this is the device we recommend I really like. Um, the iographer here is this cradle that you see this phone in and uh, these other accessories. Uh, the reason I'm kind of showing you this is this is how to turn your phone into a fully functioning video camera with onboard, you know, your biggest weak point when shooting video is gonna be your sound recording because your onboard mics are kind of terrible. Uh, this helps alleviate that. It also gives you that physical control over your camera that's uh, closer. Uh, and it does some other things. A, it allows you to put your phone on a tripod, which you're almost always gonna to wanna to do. Always shoot on a tripod if you at all can help it. And do multiple uh, camera shoots as well. I often uh, will use this, like the, the iographer as a handheld thing, and I'll set up my old DSLR in the corner on a uh, tripod and let it take in the whole scene. This makes putting together compelling programming uh, sometimes much easier if you have multiple cameras. But also the reason I'm kind of showing you this here and the iographer and this whole setup is, you know, you're gonna want to have things like this uh, exterior microphone, shotgun microphone. Uh, the, the case thing, as you can see, has a place to put on that and like lights or any other enhancements you wanna do for shoot that make this a real video camera. And this filmmaking bundle, which I'm not recommending buy from them, I think you can get, you don't need all this stuff for the most part. You're not gonna want the anamorphic lenses and the weird leather phone holder and stuff. Uh, and you can get a lot of things like the tripod and everything much cheaper elsewhere. But I, I'd like you to have a record here for like these Rode microphones and the little connector cables and stuff, because this is all the, stuff that you need to make it all work together in a really good immediate visual. So uh, that's why that's there. Uh, the YouTube video that I'm connecting is actually one of their promo videos. It goes over how this works and why. And again, they spent a bunch of money on it, so it does a much better job than I could do here. I, I recommend watching that video if you wanna know more about this particular type of setup. Um, Oh, and one good thing, just so you know about this, regarding they have options for both iPhones and Androids uh, for sizes of phone and cases. Although I, I like this one that's a multi-use case where it kind of has a slider, because if you get that, you're not stuck for your one phone that you bought it for. So that's one thing to think about if you're thinking about it, an iographer. Um, so a few more things about uh, video shooting in general. Uh, is that, um, hold on, I, I lost my place again. Sorry about, sorry about this. Um, is that, actually, no, I'm sorry. I, I guess I covered pretty much most of the video stuff. Um, although I will say one more time, just for emphasis, airplane mode. Um, so uh, well, actually a couple of things are, you know, place your camera where you can need to move the camera as little as possible. Uh, and tr try not to zoom. Zoom is a terrible, terrible thing. When people go to try to edit videos, Zoom is the one move that looks completely unnatural. It doesn't look like anything that anybody would ever do and it takes you out of the scene. Try to place yourself where you don't have to Zoom if you don't have to. And again, plan your shoot as much as possible. I'll just reiterate that for fun. So um, uh, 
the next thing is, and the last thing before the Q&A is about activating the archive. And you know, what I just wanted to kind of talk about with this is um, to bring us all home as to why we're doing this. Um, uh, archives used to be a very exclusive place. Uh, there was a lot of barriers to access and still are. Uh, the idea of a Manitos archive is in many ways a response to a desire by the people of our communities to take back control of their own stories. Uh, and a lot of that, and the reason why they want to do that often is a really essentially what is activating the archive. It's a, the ability to take all these materials and put them into play by artists, students, community scholars, genealogy bloggers, museums. Uh, you know, there's a, people are getting much better at creating content for themselves and using them to articulate their vision. Uh, that don't have to be specialists. And that's kind of a lot of what we're doing for. In our first phase, we worked with students from Highlands on activation projects. Uh, it was a summer internship program. Uh, Dr. Rael Galvez, Esteban provided very high quality images and documents to the students from his own, own archive. Things like you see here. He take photos of like this pot. Uh, he, you know, here's a, a photo from his collection of this. This isn't the building I'm about to talk about, but it's something similar. You know, all of this rich material did things like inform uh, this here. This, this first project by uh, Becca Sharp is a 3D virtual reality portrait of the Real Sala. The Sala was a big grocery store, a little bit of bar, a dance hall, and a movie theater. It was the unofficial heart of the community of Cuesta from about the 1920s until it burned down for the second time in the 1950s. Uh, Becca got very interested, and as somebody who designs 3D modeling, in recapturing and reclaiming lost spaces. And so she was able to take archival materials that were provided to her and created a walkthrough uh, or, or a, a, an experience, a virtual reality experience of the space, trying to uh, show off its uses and stuff. And she needed those high quality archival materials to do that. I don't have the video here, um, I, but it is up on the menitos.net. So you can see a video walkthrough of that space there, even though it's meant to be a virtual reality experience with the headsets and everything. I just don't have an easy way to share file. There's, you know, you need, you need the headset. Uh, the other the other project that I kind of wanted to show you was Natasha Vasquez uh, used images uh, some of them were taken by another student, Frank Naranjo, that he went out to his grandmother's house up in the mountains and took pictures of her acequia and her home and used uh, photo field recordings to bring those back to Natasha. And she used them to inform uh, these uh, Manitos personas that she uh, worked on. She also herself, uh, you know, interviewed her grandparents and they showed her some photos that hopefully someday will end up in our archive. And she's, you know, designed these, these archetypes uh, of our communities that, to my mind, are incredibly beautiful. People seem to really love them and respond to them when they see them. And we've done things like use them in outreach materials like placemats for children to color in that have gone out with uh, food share programs and things like that. And we hope to get more of those out there in the community. And again, all these were possible because she had access to high quality uh, archival images and stuff. So with that, I'm done and finished. I probably went over time. I apologize for that. I am going to uh, end the slideshow now and come back to you. And uh, we'll start the Q&A. So turn on all your microphones or, or do so when you want to speak and we will uh, talk. Oh, hold on a second. I have to... Uh, ah, I can't figure out how to get out. Hold on. I'll, I'll be with you in a second. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. There we go. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, hopefully most of you are, are still here. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and do introductions before we jump into questions, which I see it looks like there's two of them. So I, I'm going to take a cue from uh, what seems to be a popular way to do this uh, and sort of nominate somebody to go and then that person nominates the next person to go. Just say who you are, uh, how you got here or who you're associated with and uh, you know maybe to tell us a little bit about yourself. I'd like you, ideally all of you to love to start getting to know each other and talking to each other and really start working on a network. So I am going to nominate the first person on my list there and that is Alicia or Alicia Segura. Um, tell me first how to which way to pronounce your name and then tell us about yourself. Uh, you start the chain. I am on my uh, my granddaughter's. <laughs> so oh, my name is Sandy. Oh, who, oh, this is Sandy. Oh, hi. hi. Okay, I'm so glad you made it. <laughs> yeah. uh, John Valdez invited me. Yeah. 
uh, to help them on this project. Um, I'm on Facebook. I run the Families from Cerro Facebook group and also Families from Costilla. And also uh, San Luis, um, Colorado genealogy group as well. So, so this is my first time here and it sound, I love what you, you guys wanna do. <laughs> Well, I hope we can have conversations later, but go ahead and uh, nominate your person. Uh, I will nominate Katie Gray. Good choice. Hi, thank you. So I'm Katie Gray. I am the archivist for New Mexico Highlands University. Uh, I am uh, relatively new to the area. I moved to Las Vegas two years ago from Charleston, South Carolina. So I'm still learning the history of the area. And um, I think a project like this is very important um, from a professional archival standpoint, because as Shane said, for the majority of the history of, of archival collection, it's been very, um, uh, very exclusive both in who can access materials and who is represented in archives. Um, and so that's why I think these kind of uh, community archiving projects are so important because people are documenting their own history and sharing it in the ways that they feel are appropriate. So I love this project and I love being able to support in any way that I can. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm available if you want to um, talk about archivally stuff. Uh, you can always contact me through uh, the Donnelly Library at NMHU. And I will nominate Felicity. Hi, everyone. I'm the one who mistakenly thought the training started at 11. <laughs> and so uh, actually, but I still found it to be full of, packed full of great information, Shane. Thank you so much. Um, and I think um, we're trying to do a, um, I, I work at Imbuda Valley Library in Dixon and um, I've talked, I've been talking to Shane about a project that I'm trying to get off the ground. Um, that's, um, it's an oral history project linked to some uh, landscape paintings done by a local artist. And I just found a great new resource yesterday, which is someone who um, used to do professional documentaries and I think that she's going to help us with some of our sound um, oral history recordings. So um, let's see and I'm going to pass it to uh, there's someone else I know here. I think can I pass it to um, Chavela Trujillo? Yeah that Hey everyone, my name is Chavela and I work with the New Mexico Azteca Association. I actually do a lot of their mapping and surveying. Um, so this is good information just in general because I'm always out in the field collecting information. Um, I am going to head and pass it to Isabel. Hello there. I'm Isabel Trujillo. I'm Chavilla Lam, and um, I'm the director for the Abiquiu Library and Cultural Center. And so we've been doing uh, digital archiving for some time already because um, we ran out of space in the center. We've got a small building, and so about 10 years ago, started to do digital archiving and have worked with Shane quite a bit. Uh, some teenagers. Um, we've been closed now, but we're anxious to get back up and going. And so thank you, Shane. No problem. And I will get you your book scanner. We'll talk about that and also about uh, some youth stuff. So we'll, we'll have a chat. Right. Thank you all. To nominate someone. Oh, um, Elcia Segura, have you already gone on? Okay. Already gone. Then, uh, I see somebody here. Um, a gentleman with a yellow shirt, but it says Helen on his screen. Yep, that's, that's okay. I'll let him explain that. So that's you, Paul. I'm Helen. Oh, uh, okay. Otherwise known as Paul Figueroa. I'm here in Taos with the Taos County Historical Society. 
I'm on their board of directors in the capacity as program chairperson, arranging for monthly uh, lectures and presentations, and looking forward to learning more about the Manitos and how the Historical Society might enlist its uh, opportunities as it moves into a new office and exhibit area in the historic county courthouse on the plaza. That's the courthouse that contains the WPA frescoes by uh, four Taos artists. And I'll pass it along to David Maez, our folklore chairperson. David, uh, your microphone's off. Uh, yeah, look, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Many years ago, I was in deployment with the Coast Guard. I was active duty Coast Guard for many years, 33, if you want to know. And I went into an operation. It was a counter drug operation. And they asked me to do all kinds of stuff with PowerPoint and and even just basic emails. And I had no idea what they were talking about. So I married somebody who did. And I took her with me on all my subsequent deployments. And still, when they want me to do anything, even log on to uh, <laughs> meetings, I call her and she gets very mad, but she does everything for me. So I'm a special ed student with all this guy, with this stuff. And uh, I'm 73 years old now, and I don't know if I'll ever learn this stuff. But my contributions to this is I've written several uh, presentations for the <coughs> Taos Historical Society, and I have them all written out. They're, they're hour-long presentations on this different, different historical aspects of, of Taos and ranchos. For example, I, <coughs> I did a, uh, a history of the Ranchos Church, which is the history of the Ranchos Church in the Ranchos Valley for the church's 200th anniversary. And it's, um, well, it's probably 20 typewritten pages long with over 100 PowerPoints. So that could be my contribution. Um, I have no idea how I was struggling to get into the settings in my, my, uh, my iPhone. And so I know how to, how to send a text and do all that stuff. But if there's some way I can, uh, contribute to this with the presentations and other stuff like we're working now on the Torreon which is 200 years old it's one of only two left in Taos County and the biggest one and you know documenting stuff like that uh, we could do we could do stuff like that in it so nice to meet you all nice to meet you as well go ahead and uh, pick the next person Eric Romero Mi buenos días, le de Dios, me quedo a sus órdenes, humilde servidor Eric Romero. Good morning, I am your humble servant, Eric Romero. Uh, I am faculty here at New Mexico Highlands University. I chair the language and culture department, part of the diversity advisory council, and I, I'm really invested in this. I've, I've known and work, been working with Shane for, for quite some time now, really, really glad of the leadership, him and Dr. Ayala are leading to this. And it, it's dear to my heart, the project, because uh, I really believe in, in the power of, of narrative and story. Uh, the dissertation for my PhD program from the University of Arizona actually deals with New Mexico, Southern Colorado place, place identity narratives. So uh, again, I recognize the value and the, per, the, the, the potential healing process and, and the empowerment that goes along with storytelling. Uh, I do have some questions I want to come back to because I'm hoping to exercise this project in some of the courses that I'm teaching here at Highlands. And so, you know, there being a student-driven component to it as well, I'd like to make some clarifications. But again, congratulations to all. This is a very significant project. Go ahead and nominate the next person. Comadre Patricia. Good 
morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you and, and good morning to all. My name is Patricia Trujillo and I'm a faculty member at Northern New Mexico College where I teach English and Chicano studies. Um, I'm really excited to see uh, us having these kinds of meetings because I've been with the Manito project since the inception. I was really uh, happy to be a part of the original gathering at New Mexico Highlands uh, where I met Shane and others um, and it's, it's been beautiful to see this project come to life. And for me, um, I am sitting on a collection of about 13 uh, digital, like audio recordings and PowerPoints um, that my students did last fall um, with low riders in Rio Riba County. And so the, our big, my, my big uh, ta-da for that class, of course, was supposed to be in the springtime. I was gonna be working with students to get those online um, and to put them on an Omeka site so that we can start working to create an online exhibition that would help with the effort of creating a bricks and mortar um, lowrider museum that other people are working on in the community. And, and so for me, um, I'm feeling really enthused after this morning because uh, I personally had kind of stalled out on the project Obviously, um, the, the COVID moment uh, really kind of threw us off our rails in terms of doing some of the work last spring. But now I feel like sitting here in community with folks doing similar work, uh, feel, I'm feeling that bug, right? Like, let's get this organized, let's get this up and start sharing these really amazing stories. Um, and also, like, like Eric was saying, um, highlighting the work of students. Uh, when I put this um, assignment out to the class, um, I was working to create a list of people to be interviewed and I really didn't even need to do that because every student um, was like, oh, oh I'm going to interview my Theo, I'm going to interview my dad, I'm going to interview like, you know, they, they are very much a part of this lowrider culture. And so we were able then to have um, some really great and dynamic guest speakers in our class. And um, so I'm just really excited to move the, the project forward and look forward to working with you all. And, and really quick before you nominate someone, and this also goes for Dr. Romero and really for anyone else who knows, uh, there are going to be opportunities in the short term for what we're doing the Native Project now in the summer that I think can really help with a lot of your student stuff that you want to do. So we should definitely have a conversation soon. Um, actually, I'll probably, as I've threatened to do with many of you, I'll be touching bases with a lot of you soon. And I'd really like to touch bases with you because that's really exciting stuff that you've got going on right now. So uh, yeah, for me, right I have a student intern that like I would love to get trained on like how you upload and prepare files for Omeka S and I've been going back and listening to that like to some of the videos from the UNM um, gathering last year yeah. but I think it would do her so much good um, she's a dual credit student at Española High School in Northern um, and to also be working with the experts in the field so hopefully she'll be here at the next meeting that we have. Great fantastic so go to nominate your person. Um, I'm not sure who hasn't gone. Have you gone, Juliana? I nominate you. Hi, I haven't gone yet. Um, so I work at the Las Vegas City Museum and we've worked with the Monitos Project in the past. We had an exhibit here. And I here. nominate, huh? It's good to see you here. Glad you made it. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Um, who has archives, it. who's Nancy Montoya and Ava Archwager. Okay, so Nancy hasn't gone yet? Nope. Okay, I nominate her. Hi, I'm Nancy Montoya, not Nancy Archives. I'm at the Manal Historical Library of the Southwest. We are um, a library that was started in the 1970s, um, just kind of as an accident. Uh, a lot of documents were found in the school, um, in all school, which was started in the late uh, 19 or the late 1800s, and uh, almost got thrown away. But somebody had the foresight to organize that, and that's how we began. Um, we concentrate uh, on the Protestant um, Presbyterian um, aspect and influence on uh, schools, education, and churches. 
in Southern Colorado and Northern Colorado. And we also uh, do have materials from the four corner states. So, um, you know, we've got a, a huge, um, very extensive collection uh, and hopefully can serve as a, as a source for a lot of your projects. Um, we are also the archive for the school and uh, we have everything from director uh, headmaster reports to um, student records. Uh, we do have student records from the Heisen School um, and uh, materials such as that. What makes us really unusual is that a lot of our history is very personal. It comes from uh, things like family Bibles and uh, letters that were written by a lot of the pastors that uh, served in different communities. Uh, I hope that you all uh, at one point or another have a chance to uh, visit our library. I, I think you would find a, a lot of information. Um, and I nominate Eva. Hi everybody, thank you. And. Um, I'm gonna work on separating my first and last name there in my Zoom identity so it becomes intelligible. <laughs> um, so I'm very new to this uh, project and um, I am very excited about it. My own background personally is, um, you know, I come from teaching for about 15 years at the university level, both in history and in writing. So the confluence of uh, community history, community storytelling, in that way is sort of a perfect blend for my own particular interests. Um, right now I am working as the director for the Elvia Community Center, which is a combined uh, community center and also library in Villanueva. And so th the interest in this project for that organization and that location really comes out of this strong community driven interest that's been organic there for a long time in their own local history and story in part because they are um, a historic kind of area of land grant villages that have persisted in these traditional ways for generations and that kind of that history is integral to uh, what they are and who they are and they're also very aware that that demographic changes uh, mean that some of that is getting um, lost and in danger of um, not being preserved. And so that's been a longstanding interest and something that I've been interested in leveraging more um, activity with since I came on as director. And then we were fortunate to be engaged with the Humans of New Mexico project a couple of years ago that was going around doing oral histories in small rural communities in the area of northern New Mexico. And through reconnecting with them and getting access to the recordings that they had done here and wanting to continue that idea of oral, oral histories that were community histories. Um, that's what led me to this project. So I'm, uh, I've got a lot of enthusiasm and a little overwhelmed right now and it's just great to meet everyone, so thanks. Oh, well, well, thank you. Thanks to everyone. Um, so those were, uh, I think we got everybody, right? Um, so, you know, like Patricia, uh, this has actually been my favorite part is hearing what all of you are doing. It's got me actually really excited. And so, yes, I, I will be following up because I think for a, with a lot of, uh, the, I, I'm overdue for a conversation. I was concentrating on this and I've been neglecting calling a lot of you to, to see what's going on. So uh, you will um, almost certainly be hearing from you, but yeah, it's just really exciting to, to hear what everyone is doing. And um, I hope that you can find some places also where you can work together and support each other um, through what you just heard today. Um, it, so just really quick, I don't think there are, there were none in chat. So I either did a really good job or a terrible job and I'm gonna choose to believe I did a good job of answering everyone's, uh, if they're providing information, but are there any questions that I needed to answer? Sort of almost asking that as a formality. Um, or is there anything anybody wants to say more about um, or, or requests that anyone has? Um. Uh, Shane, I was yeah. wondering if uh, these materials will be provided uh, in some kind of uh, uh, 
paper format? Uh, well, um, well, actually, that's a good question. I haven't thought about doing it in paper format. Uh, we could think about that and talk about that, figure out how that would actually work. Um, maybe uh, we can, I mean, I have my notes, which I could maybe get into some intelligible to other human shape. Uh, you know, the recording itself will probably be up on YouTube, uh, probably on our blog and probably with, uh, on the Humanities Council blog. But as far as a written thing, I'm sure we can either get a transcript. You might have noticed, uh, or actually not sure if you were able to see it, uh, there, we, I use subtitles and so there could also be a transcript of those um, that I think I can probably grab out of the file somehow. So I will explore that and I will get back to you on that particular question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, totally. Shane, Shane if I could key on that a little bit as well, I, I, I think it would be viable uh, to have some kind of a sort description of, you know, the intention of the project, both from a big, uh, big, from the big picture, as well as some of the specifics. And again, you know, my, my criteria or reason for wanting to do that is if, if I'm doing this as a student driven project, student participation, uh, their unfamiliarity and, 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 you know, I, 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 I usually do a workshop training with them for ethnographic qualitative research methods. And within that, we speak heavily about, you know, again, what that protocol is, not only from the technological aspect, but the introductory statements on the part of, you know, introducing themselves to the project, to being respectful, to establishing that rapport, confidentiality, all those issues. So if you have something in place that could help them to introduce the, what the project is, you know, at, at, a, at an official level, and then I could work with them as far as, again, how to establish respectful relationships and, and again, some of the technical aspects of the office. But I think that's important that we, particularly if we're working with students who are not privy to this training, that they have some kind of protocol guidelines to be able to work from. Okay. Um, no, actually, that's really good feedback. Um, thanks. Uh, I think a good thing would be to say a good starting point is the Menino's not the net blog for a lot of answers. And I think that a good thing would be to say, assess that and then we can work on uh work on on seeing what that you know filling in the gaps of what's not there and organizing in a way that's useful to yourself and to anyone else who needs a tool like that uh or you know or what how best to to format that and and what other answers uh could be provided for that so yeah let's definitely talk about that um and address some of your other questions i know that i have an email out to you to if we can meet next week, maybe some for both in town and and start to work on some of the other initiatives that you spoke about as well. Um, yeah, um, just to let you know, I'm reading some of the comments. Uh, I'm glad you like the subtitles. Uh, I will continue to do those. Uh, and um, the PowerPoint. Yeah, I, I will share that. That's uh, when I said I can share the deck. Uh, that's kind of what I mean is I, I can send you the PowerPoint if you want it uh, and try to to get that out to, to whoever would like it. Just, just go ahead and, and, and ask um, for that. Um, yeah, does, does anyone else have feedback or any other comments that they would like to make? I know we've gone way over time, which I apologize for, sort of. I, I'm sort of not sorry, because I was really glad to hear what everybody is thinking about. Um, so I, I'm not sorry we went way over time. Um, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, is that I know I mentioned in the email that uh, I thought I'd want to do this every week. I'm actually thinking we'll do this every other week for the next two meetings. Um, uh, this seems like a good time for everyone. If it is, uh, I see some head nodding and things like that. We'll keep with this time and we'll do the second training in two weeks from now and then the third one two weeks after that. I was myself made aware that um, I'm neglecting some other things I need to be doing. And so I probably, including calling all of you is one of the things I'm neglecting. So next week I'll do that and then we'll do the training the, the following week. So if that's okay with everyone, we'll plan for that. And uh, uh, hopefully that continues to work. Um, the other thing just wanted to touch base. I know I put it on the email. And so I'd like to really get everybody on board and, and, and starting to do this is the, um, the, keeping track of uh, matching hours because uh, this is a really good opportunity for project, the, project, the Menitos project in general and all the projects we all may want to work on together and work towards uh, to get a little bit more uh, financial support for. So just you know, keep track of this hour, two hours really at this point that we've spent on this and start doing that really for yourselves. 
for your staff, for your community partners, for your students, for anybody who is working on really anything that's kind of Manito's project related. Uh, and then we'll, you know, if something's a little too far off, then we'll say that was a little too far off. But just start collecting everybody, at, everything at first and keeping track of it so that we can start to match and, and find matches for that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, Ellen uh, and Mimi are really going to be the wizards of architecting all that. I'm, I'm the collector and I can help you with that part about it and, and talk about that. Um, so let's see. Uh, Oh, I see. Yeah, the transcription does go a little bit weird sometimes. It's it's like watching the teleprompter on TV, and you're like, "Really? That's that's what you decided that would?" So yeah, that that'll be fixed if we use that as the basis. We'll do some editing on that there. So um, so yeah, great. Well, thanks again, all of you, for taking the time out to attend this. And I hope the next two, the next one will be on, uh, and which might be related to a lot of um, you know. I, I'm thinking, Patricia, yourself in particular. The next training might be a thing that's really good for that because that's about, you know, we're going to focus on co collecting stories and histories online uh, using Zoom or whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know, online uh, story and memory gathering will be kind of the focus along with some other online practices. So keep that in mind uh, as you think towards the next two weeks and other people that you might want to see benefit from that training. So uh, thanks everyone for attending. I uh, will uh, uh, let you all go and say goodbye now and hope to see the rest of you in two weeks. So thank you. Um, I'll see you all later. <laughs>